Yo, what is happening guys? It is Scorpions and I am so freaking happy to be finally bringing you my guide on how to play the pig in Dead by Daylight. I know it's been two years since I've started streaming and I've only just made a guide, I know, I know. But here we are, it's finally here. This guide is going to show you the beginnings of how to play the pig, the advanced on how to play it, where to dash, where not to dash, how to dash in certain tiles, how to use the stealth, how to trap properly. It will show you good builds, it will show you some good add-ons, and it will show you how to play against her as survivor. So even if you don't play as her ever, you still might learn a thing or two from this video. A lot of work has gone into this by myself and a lot of other people, so I'd appreciate it if you leave a like. In the description below, a lot of different areas in the guide are going to be timestamped because this video is going to be a lengthy one because I wanted to try and pack everything possible into one video. I made sure everything is type stamped properly to allow you to navigate the video easier rather than just watching the entire thing. So let's get straight into the video. So I think it'll be best to start with who she actually is and what her power actually does. So who is she? Well, she is Amanda Young from Saw. She is the fourth licensed killer added to this game. Uh, she's a 4.6, 32-meter terror radius killer. Her power is pretty complex, honestly. The best way for me to describe the power to you is to split it up into three categories, which is the crouching and stealthing, the ambush dash, and the traps, the traps being by far the most complex bit to describe. So, the crouching and stealthing is pretty simple, honestly. You press the active ability button, which is whatever it is for you, and she crouches down. Um, takes 1.3 seconds to crouch. Once she's crouched, her heartbeat fades down to zero. She gains the undetectable status effect, which means that she is immune to all aura reading perks. She has no red light, etc. So you can just sneak around, completely unseen. <laughs> sneak around, uh, sneak up to gens, etc., etc. Pretty straightforward. The ambush, again, to describe is pretty straightforward, but we'll be going into this in detail a lot later you can find that in the description where that actually is in the video while she's crouching she has the ability to launch herself forward in an ambush sprint basically take charges up for a short while and then she lunges forward at the killer's at any killer's regular lunge speed which is 6.9 meters a second for well, the dash is two seconds, so 6.9 meters for two seconds. And she launches herself forwards with complete control over the dash, so it's very good at countering things like power loops, etc., etc. Again, we're going into that a lot later on in the video. And the third and final thing is the traps. This is probably the most complex bit of the power to describe, because there's a lot to this. Effectively, Pig spawns in with four at base, four inactive reverse bear traps. When you're standing over a survivor that's in the dying state, you get the ability to place one of these helmets on the survivors. And effectively, what a survivor has to then do is remove the helmet at one of the four jigsaw boxes that have spawned in across the map. Once the helmet's placed, the survivor sees where the boxes are in a white aura, and the pig can see where the boxes are at all times. So yeah, you place the helmet, they have to then go remove the helmet. Uh, the helmet itself does nothing, it's inactive, until a generator pops. And once a gen pops, the helmet becomes active. And at that point, a two and a half minute timer at base starts in the helmet. And if the survivor fails to remove the helmet in those two and a half minutes, then they die. It, it kills them. So yeah, you've got two and a half minutes. And while it's active, you are... You cannot escape the trial through an exit gate. You can jump in the hatch, but you can't escape through an exit gate when it's active. If it's not active, you can. So yeah, there's a lot to the power. 
There's a lot to the power, a lot of really cool strats you can do with the power, etc. So we're probably going to start off with explaining the crouch and the stealth in a bit more detail, how to gen grab, etc, etc. Stuff like that. So here's where I'm going to split the power up into a bit and, and go into a bit more detail about the three things. So starting off with the crouching, pressing control, it takes the pig 1.3 seconds at base to crouch and during that time she slows down at a steady rate from 4.6 meters a second to 3.6 meters a second and upon reaching 3.6 meters upon the crouch animation ending the heartbeat begins to fade and that takes an additional four seconds so after pressing the active ability button it takes 5.3 seconds total for you to completely lose your heartbeat as the pig. Your red light, however, disappears the moment you're done crouching. So that doesn't fade, that's just, it's on for the 1.3 seconds you're crouching, and then once you're done crouching, it turns off, it's gone. It is worth noting that while you're crouch walking, you are unable to grab people off of gens or any interactable objects. So the only way you can grab with pig is by standing up and to, for that you have to commit through the entire 1.3 second animation again and then upon the animation ending you can instantly grab interesting thing as well is that your red lights and your terror radius are completely gone even while you are standing up as the pig your heartbeat and red light only start appearing after you've gone through the entire 1.3 second animation of standing up uh, your red light insta appears like it did before, like it, how it instantly turned off. And your heartbeat fades out from where you're standing at a much, much quicker rate than it faded. It takes roughly a second and a half second around that sort of area to fade out. So it does give you the opportunity to quickly sneak up to somebody on a gen, for example, and stand up and pull them off of the gen. This all means that there ends up being some skill behind trying to grab with a pig. You can see in the clip above that you're going to want to try and time, time it so that you're done standing up the moment you are behind the survivor. So you can stand up and instantly interact with them and pull them off the generator. And to do that, you can see in the clip that I start standing up kind of around the corner away from them, a few meters away, so that I know by the time I'm done standing, I'm going to be right behind them and I can grab. Even if you get a false grab bug or whatever, you can still get a free M1 with Pig in a lot of situations like this, so it ends up being very worth learning the timing on standing up. It is always, always better to stand up and go for a grab in this situation rather than ambushing them. Your ambush is for chasing. It is not really for attacking somebody working on a gen because they might have sprint burst or whatever you don't know the best way to think about it is to think about the health states of the survivor if you pull them off of a generator you effectively deal two health states of damage to the survivor because you grab them and you instantly put them on your shoulder and if you mess up the grab you will very often get the free m1 so in this situation you either get two health states or you get one health state if you ambush the gen instead then you will guarantee that you're only going to get at least one health spate. And even then, you actually might not get any, because they'll hear your roar, they might have sprint burst, and if they have sprint burst, you get nothing. So you either get one health state or no health states by ambushing a gen, and you get two health states or one health state by going for the grab. It's always better to go for the grab. Honestly, that's kind of all there is to it with the crouching. You should be crouching a lot during chase to ambush dash, but we'll be getting into that into a lot of detail a lot later on. When you should actually crouch, as in when you should be doing it before you sneak up to the gen, is something that I'm probably going to cover in the perks area, because I want to talk about the build I use for that, and to do that, I'm going to wait until the perks area. So if you want to know about when to actually crouch to sneak up to a gen, look at the perks section in the description below. So the next thing to really talk about, to be honest, is the helmets, the traps. We've already mentioned kind of before how they kind of work, but now it's kind of talking about the strats behind the helmets and the thinking behind them. The traps, like I said before, are for slowing the game down, 
So you, as the pig, need to kind of think game by game at what point you actually need the game slowing down. So what I tend to do, in fact, what I do almost every single game is the first four people I down, I'll put a trap on their head because early game pressure is something you desperately need as a killer that has well, normal movement speed. She has no way of getting from A to B quickly. So gaining early map pressure uh, is is always going to be a plus. So it's it's 99% of the time better to place your traps super, super early. First four, you're down, put the helmets on. Gives you some bit of map pressure to work with and then retain it once the helmets pop off. But like I said, this is a game by game thing. So if you do find yourself in a game where the survivors are going down quite quickly at the very beginning, then sometimes it actually might be better to save your helmets for later. If you feel like it's it's three gens left and gens are popping now, you might want to start busting out some helmets at this point. But most of the time, you'll be using them when you're first down. There are some other strats when it comes to helmets, like you can specifically build for an endgame pig, which is very rare these days after the endgame change that happened a while ago. But it's still a possibility thing that you can do. You can bring perks like Blood Warden, etc. like that. And you can save all of your traps to one gen and place your helmets on the survivors at one gen. This is one of those extremely high risk, high reward strats that I wouldn't really recommend you try hugely often. But like, if you want to try it, it's there trapping at one gen and then they potentially pop the last gen with the helmets on and then once that happens all you've got to do as killer is open the door and trigger end game because you're going to have two or three active helmets at that point in the end game and that is a very hard situation for them plus blood warden etc it's cool when it works but it's very hard to pull off so going into a little bit about the numbers behind it i said before already it takes two and a half minutes by default for the for the helmet to explode once activated. Putting a trap on the head as the pig takes 3.3 seconds, so when you interact with a dying survivor, putting a trap on the head at base, 3.3 seconds, and it's on their head, and searching a saw box for a survivor takes 12 seconds at base. And again, like I said before, the helmets are RNG, but it's not strictly true. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how the helmets actually work. During the loading screen of the game, when you're initially loading into the match, the game actually picks the four saw boxes that the helmet's going to come off at. So basically, each helmet is given a key. Each key is then assigned to a random saw box. So all four keys could actually be in the same box, like one box could remove all four helmets, or they could all be in different ones, etc, etc. So the game already knows before you even trap anybody which helmet is being removed on which box. So the survivor just has to find the correct box. So rather than it being traditional RNG where it's, I don't know, a 25% chance, for example, it is actually a 0% chance in three of the four boxes and the fourth box is an 100% chance to remove it. You could find the correct box first time, second try, third try, etc. And that's kind of how they work. And the last thing to mention is that the pig herself can see when traps are active, but she can't see the timer itself. The only way she gets an indication of, of how long it is until the helmet detonates is if she finds the survivor and sees the blinking light on the back of the helmet. Whereas the survivor in the HUD can actually see their own timer and see how long it takes before they die. Although you're always better as the pig to ignore people that have helmets on because these people are actively not doing gens, they're busy doing other things. So unless the survivor literally runs into you or they're stupid to search a saw box next to you and chase or whatever, blah blah, there's a lot of situations. But other than those situations, it's always better to leave them and not towel them and just let them do their own thing because it's always better to pressure those without helmets on because people with helmets are very often not doing gens. So now we get to the most important part of the guide. So far up to now, we've merely been talking about more about how she works rather than how to play her as such because there's nothing amazingly skillful to learn about the traps and the same thing goes with the crouching. It's a little bit obviously with chain grabbing, etc. But this part is about the ambush. This is the part of Pig that makes her unique, makes her so fun to play as and play against. And honestly, I have a lot to say about this. So to make this easier, I'm going to split the next part of the guide up into three parts. 
this is going to allow me to properly cover everything you're going to need to do with the dash, etc. So the three things you need to know about as a pig when you're dashing is how to double back fake, how to moonwalk with the dash, which for this video I'm going to call moon dashing, and how to fake your dash so you bait people away from the loop by pretending to do it and then actually cancelling it. Now before getting into those three components, it's most important to me to talk about how the, the dash itself actually works as a power. So all the numbers behind it, etc. like that, because I feel like it will build up a good foundation to be able to build from there into actually how to dash. As I've mentioned previously, Piggy has the ability to crouch down into a stealth mode, allowing her to sneak around, etc. like that. But while also in the stealth mode, you have the ability to be able to dash. Now, this dashing works very similar to a regular lunge, except it's much, much longer. And while crouching, you can charge up your ambush. Now, charging up your ambush takes 0.75 seconds to do, but you have to keep in mind that while you're charging it, you slow down from your crouch mo movement speed as pig, which is 3.6 to... You slow down from 3.6 to 0. You completely stop while charging. So near the end of the, the charge up, you are not moving, which you have to keep in mind as the pig when you try and ambush. After the charge up, you sprint forward at 6.9 meters a second, which is every other killer's normal lunge speed. But rather than just doing a regular lunge, you sprint forwards for two seconds. For the first half a second of your dash, you're accelerating from zero to 6.9. But after, those, after the half a second is gone, you are effectively in full control of your melee for a second and a half at full speed. You have the ability to go forwards, sideways with dash. You can't traditionally go backwards, but there is a way to do it, which we'll be discussing later in the video. Now, something else to note is that your red stain and your terror radius both return during the dash. The red light appears immediately once the dash starts, and your terror radius takes about half a second to fully expand. The last basic thing to mention is that there's two audio cues surrounding the ambush. One of which is audible to both the killer and the survivor, and the second of which is only audible to the survivor. During the charge up of the dash, so there's the, uh, the, the three quarters of a second charge up, the pig lets out a loud roar, both of which you as a killer can hear and you as a survivor can hear. This sound is very useful for you as a killer to be able to bait, etc., which we'll discuss later. But there's also a second sound admitted once the dash actually starts. The moment uh, the ambush starts, a high-pitched kind of stinger noise is emitted in a 16 meter radius around the pig, audible to only the survivors. This noise effectively lets them know you fully committed to your dash and that you should watch out for her being nearby. If you're, for example, in the gen, on a gen and you don't hear her heartbeat or whatever, this lets you know that she's nearby enough to be able to hit you with the dash. Right, now that we've discussed what, it, what the ambush is and what the ambush does, let's talk a little bit more about how you actually do it as a killer. So, like I said before, there were the three things. We're going to start off with talking about double back faking at a basic pallet loop. So, in a chase as, as the pig, the first thing you're going to want to do when you reach a pallet loop is to take control of the pallet. You want to be at the pallet side when you crouch. You want to be in the pallet or near the pallet when you crouch. Because if you don't, if you don't start your dash on that side, then the survivor can simply just camp the pallet. And, and get away with not being hit. So you're going to want to go to the pallet. Approaching the loop, crouch, and take control of the pallet. So no matter where they go, they're stuck on the other side of the loop. And simply what you're going to do is charge your dash it facing in one direction, and then near the end of the charge up, you're going to spin around and then dash in the opposite direction and kind of like troll them or debate them into thinking you're going one way, when in reality you actually go the other way. If you just dashed in one direction, it, it wouldn't really work because the survivor runs away from you. As you can see in the uh, the picture, the survivor would run away from you and, and be able to run back around to the pallet. So what you do is you fake one way and you go the other way, hence double back faking. You fake one way and go the other way. So they run away from you and you end up turning around and you can cut them off the other way. 
this dash actually works on pretty much every single power loop in the game, minus a couple of exceptions. Really very small amount. It works on Shaq, it works on every power loop. Although Shaq will discuss in more detail, because anyway, works on pretty much every single power loop in the entire game. There are very, very, there's a very, very small number of parts in the game you can't dash on in this way. So once you get this basic double back faking down, you, you should be good. Naturally, this is just as basic as it comes. There's a lot more to it than this, you know, because they might run away or... In addition to this, double back faking also kind of works when the pallet is already thrown down. So the survivor will camp one side of the pallet waiting for you to, bait, um, to break it. What you can do is walk over to the right or the left and stand in the middle of the loop. And you can dash towards the survivor, faking that way, and then actually going the other way. And you can cut them off as they vault the pallet. Uh, again, it's double back faking, and again, it works, and it throws people off. And it allows you to get yourself a free hit on a lot of pallets in this game. It's very, very hard to traditionally loop a good pig. You have to be very smart with it as a survivor and break away from your loops, etc. As far as double back faking is concerned, it doesn't really matter whether or not the pallet loop has got... Uh, LOS blockers, line of sight blockers, or whether or not it's like Blood Lodge where it's very, very open. You're able to double back fake on, on both tiles for different reasons, because on one they see, like on Blood Lodge, they see the direction you're facing, so they know to run, say if you're going to dash clockwise around the loop, they know to run away from you. Whereas if you're on a map like Shelter Woods, where they cannot see you, when you actually start your dash, they see your red lights peek around a corner, so they know that they have to run away from the red light. So then you double back fake and you cut them off that way. So it doesn't really matter what, what the bloop is, it doesn't matter if they can see you, if they can't see you. You just gotta make sure you take control of the pallet. Again, this all works in jungle gyms, etc. like that as well, but we'll get into the, into the more complex tiles later in the video. For now, though, I'm keeping it basic and I'm sticking to the basic pallet loops in the game. Now, obviously, double back faking doesn't work on every single survivor in the game. Some of them have already figured out what you have to do against Pig in those situations. And the best thing to do in that situation as a survivor is honestly run away. You just abandon the tile, abandon the loop. I'll discuss in more detail later in the video about how to play against Pig as a, as a survivor, but I'll keep referring to what you have to do throughout the video like that. So, like I said, running away from the loop works very well as a survivor, and as a pig, you need to keep in mind whether or not the survivor will abandon the tile, or whether or not they will stay. And this is kind of where the skill behind pig comes into it, is that you have to be able to read the survivor you're chasing. You've got to figure out what kind of survivor you have. Do you have the kind of survivor that's going to run away from the loop, or do you have the kind of survivor that's going to stay at a loop? If you think that this is the kind of survivor that runs, the other thing you can do instead of double back faking at a pallet tile is actually just baiting the, the dambush itself. You bait it, you roar at them, you give the impression you're gonna dash, and then you stand up and you cancel the dash and you don't do it. And you can very often force them into an area because you, as the pig, have the ability to decide in which direction the survivor runs away from the pallet loop. If you know you've got a runner, you can move around the loop crouched or move around the loop standing up to the point where you know, say if you want them to run left because left's a dead zone, you'd move them around to the left point and then you would crouch and they will run and you can stand up and you'll get hit. So this ability to be able to decide where they run helps a lot with the survivors that just bail whenever you do it. You can bait the roar, like I said, you'll crouch, roar, they'll run. You can stand up and you often get a free hit from it. I'm now going to actually talk about the final basic thing that you need to learn about as a pig, and that is moon dashing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, pig can dash forwards, she can dash left, she can dash right, but she can't dash backwards traditionally. But the pig actually does have the ability to dash backwards. It's 
pretty neat and will help you a lot. And specifically, this is more aimed towards maze tiles where they can't see you, where they have a line of sight block. You moon dash, you hide your red light, and you can get the a lot of hits this way. Now you might be wondering, how scorpions? How do you actually moon dash? How do you actually dash backwards with pig? Well, it's a bit weird in the sense that you actually need to be beside a building to do this. You can't actually moon dash out in the open. You have to be next to a wall. And effectively, what you got to do is you look at the wall at a slight angle and then you ambush dash. And then rather than holding down W when you dash, you're going to want to hold down the A button or the D button depending on which way of the wall you're looking at. And you will, if you're looking at the right angle, you'll actually slide backwards down the wall. Which is why I say it's useful in jungle gyms, because you can can crouch next to a wall at a jungle gym and then you can moon dash backwards and you can get the hit of the pallet. It works a lot of the time, it's pretty cool. It's a neat little trick that you can do with Pig, because not a lot of people know that you can dash backwards with her. It actually also works on pallet loops on big open maps it's like Blood Lodge, the double car loop. That one you can moon dash a lot on instead of double back faking. Like if the survivor's fallen for the double back fake once and they don't think they're going to fall for it twice, you can try moon dashing and it actually will work on those situations as well. It works as well on other maze tiles. For example, a lot of those ones, the TNL walls have got big ladder sight blockers. Uh, it works on them and it works on the other power loop maze tile if you can time it right. Those three that we just talked about are kind of the main three parts on how to dash with pig and practicing those in different situations and combining the three of them or the, even the two of them allows you to pull off some pretty amazing things with her stuff that a lot of people playing against pig don't really expect because most pigs you go against the standard pig just runs around the loop like a normal killer they don't crouch they don't do anything they don't try to use their power at all it sucks because this is a big big part of her kit and utilizing it and using it properly helps you out so so much and it sucks that no one really does it right so i'm gonna move on to the more advanced part of the dashing guide which is explaining how to actually use and combine the three things in different situations in different maze tiles and loops etc so th those three things are kind of the basics to what you need to know about how to dash moon dashing obviously is a bit more technical but they're they're kind of the basic things that you need to know but you also need to know how to use them in in maze tiles like i said and in other tiles that are not traditional part loops etc right so let's start with tnl walls uh this maze tile is featured on a lot of maps pretty much all of them in fact and this is very, very dashable and very easy to play out as the pig. It requires using the three basic skills that you've already learned in the, in the video, but combining them in order to pull it off. A lot of the time, it's often best to, well, A, first figure out what kind of survivor you're against. Are they a person that will run when you crouch? or they're a person that will stay at the tile. Typically, people will stay at maze tiles a lot more than power loops. Like, people will often abandon the power loop when you crouch, but on a maze tile, a lot of people will tend to stay. So at the CNL wall, what you're gonna wanna do is crouch quite early, and you don't actually need to dash straight away. It's often best to just walk around, crouch, because in this in this stance, chase hasn't dropped, but you have no red light, etc. So it's often best to crouch straight away and start sneaking around. And then when you are at the bottom of the T or the bottom of the L, that is where you will try and spot where the person is. On maps such as Autohaven, you can actually see through the maze tile. There's a lot of holes in the wall which allow you to better to predict where the survivors are. But if you're not on that map, it's often best to listen quite carefully for the footsteps of the survivor as to where they are. Again, as you've done throughout the entirety of the thing, you double back fake. You fake one way with the dashing and you go the other way. And very often the survival will run around the maze tile and walk straight into your dash. This works on the T, on the L, both of them. On the L side, you can actually also moon dash along the L. You crouch down by the window side and then you moon dash backwards and you can cut them off before they reach the window of the T. These things all work. These things are things that you can try against different sorts of survivors. Obviously, some survivors will fall for one thing, some survivors will fall for other things. In the example above, you can see that I combine crouching around, sneaking, like we talked about in the stealth and the crouching area, and then I combine that with the, with the double back fake in order to actually get a hit on the survivor. And this is the kind of thing that separates a good pig from a bad pig. 
a good pig is able to use multiple different things at once, different parts of their power in order to get a hit. The guy couldn't see my red light, so he couldn't track where I was, and at the same time, when he did finally get a glimpse of me, he thought I was dashing one way, and then I faked the round and was going the other way instead, because the, cra the, the, uh, the chase hadn't dropped, and he couldn't hear my, my knife sheath away over the chase music, so he had no idea I was actually crouching, so he couldn't actually find me at all throughout the entire time, and I end up getting a free hit. Jungle gyms, etc. play out a lot like the same way, although it's often best to not actually dash at a jungle gym. Uh, it's, off it's always good to crouch here, like it's always good to, to crouch and hide your red light and sneak around, etc. But on certain tiles, certain jungle gyms, it's better to not actually to ba not actually dash, because very often they will just sneak past you and you just won't be able to connect the hit. But on certain tiles, in certain situations, certain scenarios against different survivors, it's actually worth it. So in the clip you see, again, I crouch, I stay crouched for a while walking around. I'm tracking them through the Colbin Farm maze tile because that is see-through, slightly see-through, so you can see where they are. I fake one way with the dash, and I go the other way. And they end up walking straight into my dash. Specifically, if the jungle gym was spawned in this particular variation with the window on on the short L wall side of the jungle gym, you can actually moon dash along the side wall. So as you see in this clip on Macmillan, I crouch down on the window side of the jungle gym and then actually moon dash backwards and come across the area and get the hit because this guy saw my red light on the other side so he cut back the other way and he ended up running straight into my dash and in some situations if you time this right or if the survivor times this wrong you can actually get the pallet gone and get the hit like with a lot of things it's because you're smaller and it's because you have no red light people underestimate just how strong it actually is that you can crouch and then a second later you have no red light at all. People just don't realize how disorientating that is as a survivor. Now, the shack is a tricky one to explain because it really, really depends on what sort of survivor you're playing against. But this is the tile that I will crouch, or I will dash, sorry, the least. I will often crouch down again and sneak around and hide my red light but there's only really one or two situations where I'll, where I'll ever actually dash. Now to explain how to briefly run Shaq as a killer in general, it's always better for me personally to try and chase the survivor clockwise around Shaq, if we're looking at it from the top down, with the window on the bottom. It's always better to chase them clockwise so that they run into Shaq through the pallet doorway, because that window there is very, very easy to play out from that side because it's got a short wall and this is the situation where you can actually dash. They come in through the shack, you fake going into the shack with the dash and you cut back and go along the outside of the shack wall and you can hit them as they vault the window because they see your red light going into the shack, they panic and they vault it and you hit them. Depending on the survivor, if they figure out you're actually going to go into shack, you can actually just not fake and commit to it and again, you can get a hit this way but it really depends on the survivor you're playing against. The more experience you get with Pig, the more you'll kind of learn what survivor is what and what survivor will fall for what. But if you are being forced to loop the shack counterclockwise, because again, some survivors are decent at this and they will be able to make you run the way they want. If a survivor is running counterclockwise on the shack, crouching as you go up the long wall towards the doorway, and then walking into shack and then standing up again will often cause them to fake the window rather than vault it. Because what most survivors do is they will enter shack at the locker doorway, they will look behind them to see if there's a red light, and if there is a red light, they will vault the window. So what you do as pig is you crouch, you hide your red light, and you walk into the shack, they look behind them, they see no red light, and then they fake vaulting the window because they think you're not there. And then it turns out you're actually at the doorway and you can very often either dash or stand up and get the hit before they reach the pallet. And if you don't get the hit, then they will have to drop the pallet, otherwise they will get hit, and you can quickly deal with Shack pallet in this way. Shack is a very fun tile to play out as pig, and it often creates a lot of exciting mind games. A general M1 tip here for any M1 killer is that vaulting the window in Shack is your friend. I'll often vault the window two or three times to try and debate someone into getting hit, uh, because they will run and they will not expect the three vaults. People never expect a double or a triple vault. 
So they will run around the outside of the shack and you just vault straight into them and you can get the hit. The survivors that are good will run all the way around the back of the shack, back down to the shack pallet side to get to, uh, to be looping the way they want. In this situation, again, being a general M1 killer is your friend. They have to go into the shack and they'll either fault or fake the window and you can bait them out either way. Now, as I said previously, it's good to crouch and hide your red light before walking into shack, although sometimes it's actually better to just go around the front to the window side anyway, because if the survivor's smart enough to figure out what you're doing, they'll still vault the shack window, even if they can't see a red light. So in that situation, it's better to just keep walking forwards and actually go around the outside of the shack to the window. Again, with the more you play shack with pig, the more you will kind of get to see what sort of survivor's which. It's really hard to describe a good survivor, just outright. I'll be here for hours trying to explain that. But all I could say is the more you play pig, or the killer in general, the more you can just kind of tell. You can just sort of feel when a survivor is, is decent or when they're going to try stuff. It's so hard to describe, other than you just know when it is. You just know. The more you play, you can just tell. So that's what you've got to keep in mind, and that's how you know what sort of mind game you should be doing, and whether you should actually fake it, or just over-exaggerate and then go to the left, and then actually still get the hit through the window. Something I do as killer, and this is not just for pig, this is for kind of every killer. When I personally play killer, I over-exaggerate everything I'm doing to the survivors. So, for example, running up to a T in L wall, I will make it very, very obvious to the survivor that I am cutting left, so the survivor will fake the window. And then what I actually do is instead of cutting left, I just moonwalk on the wall and then get the hit anyway. So say I don't want the survivor to vault the window, I will massively over-exaggerate that I'm gonna go left. I'll be like, hey survivor, I'm going left. You should totally fake the window. So they'll fake it, and then I just moonwalk backwards, and I'm like, ha, hey, just kidding, I had no intention of going left and now I get a free hit because you thought that and faked the window instead. There's just little things like this that you just pick up through playing the game, and this is all just experience through playing the game. These are things that, well, now you know about it, you can try it, but these are just things that you pick up after a lot of a lot of hours of playing this game, trying, to, trying different things, seeing if they work, seeing if they don't work. Right, so that's maze tiles and shack done. It's now time to move on to very briefly discuss building tiles, because Pig again shines on building tiles specifically tiles like asylum which have got a lot of drop downs where rather than vaulting the window as the pig you can actually go upstairs and you can dash out of the window and you can get a hit very 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 easily stuff like grim pantry or pale rose building tiles like this where you can just try and vault things or try and get on top of things with pigs dash so again on top of the pier you can dash onto the but the wall and you can actually jump over the window there's some pallets you can jump on blood lodge there's some pallets you can jump on chapel there's various different cool things like this that you can do with the ambush and honestly none of them are particularly hard to do the harvester being another one you just need to know they exist and a lot of this is just trial and error personally what i do is whenever a new map comes out i go into kill your friends with pig and I just dick about for like an hour and I try and find different spots of what you can what you can dash on and what you can't dash on. And then when I get into the game, I, I just try and hit them. And a lot of the time they work and a lot of the time they don't. And then I just I know at that point what I can and can't do. Uh, in the background, there's going to be some clips showing you different ones you can do. I think that's going to be better than explaining them individually because none of them are that hard. It's just once you know they exist, you can kind of do them and apply them at certain situations. Asylum is probably the trickiest one because there's various different ones you can do and a lot of them are based on kind of listening for the survivor. So you go upstairs a lot of the time and then you listen for the footsteps downstairs to know where they vault and which way they go when they vault. But kind of once you get used to how footsteps work in this game, you can predict where they're going to be before you jump out of the window on the top floor. So for example, the infinite window on the right side of the asylum, very often the survivor is just going to try and run the infinite on you. So that's the predictability you have. You know exactly where they're going to be, so you, rather than vaulting the window after them, you go upstairs, you go to the drop down, and very often they're just going to be trying to run the window on you mindlessly without really thinking about it, and then they'll check behind them and they see that you're not there, and very often they will try and cut back to the window again rather than committing to the full loop, 
and this allows you to pounce off of the second floor and very often get the hit on the person by the window. It's just practice. The more you try these kind of things, the more you see that they kind of just fit together and work. In the preschool, you're able to also jump over the hole with the dash. And the best thing I can recommend with this is looking at how it's done in these clips and then copying it yourself in a kill your friends. If you can get a mate, you just keep trying it as it is in the video. You can slow it down and have a look frame by frame of how I do it. And then you'll be able to transfer that into the games that you play yourself. Honestly, it's just practice. Once you know these things exist, it's just practice and seeing how they're applied and where they're applied before you can do it yourself. The map she struggles on, honestly, she struggles on anything that's quite large. So run fields that are huge maps, but have also got very safe power loops, stuff like that, stuff like cow shed. Cow shed being the worst because there are very little towers you can dash on at the time of this video. Stuff like mother's dwelling as well is quite hard because of its size. But there's also this kind of backwards thing. Sure, they're they're quite hard to win chases on and gain map pressure because they're really large. But at the same time, you're guaranteed to have four sword boxes that are really far apart from each other. So that it's more likely the survivors are going to die to the helmet and spend more time searching boxes for keys, etc. to try and remove them because they're so far apart. It becomes like a double-edged sword kind of thing where it's not really my kind of play style as pig to enjoy that kind of gameplay. But if trap gameplay is your thing, then it totally could work for you, these kind of maps. It just really depends on the player that you are. Let's talk a little bit about how you actually play against the pig as a survivor. Because I've spoken a lot in detail about how to ambush and how to play around a lot of tiles, etc. But it's only fair to talk about how to also play against such such mind games, etc. So if I'm going to start with a basic power loop, the most important thing you need to do as a survivor, as I've said already, is run away from the loop. But you don't just simply run away because the pig will be able to bait you out and get you. So the best thing to do is to, when you approach a loop, have a plan as to where you're going to go next if the pig tries to crouch. And if she does, the moment she starts crouching, you run. Sometimes you may not make the next area because the pig has properly baited you out. But if the tiles are really compact, you should be able to make the next tile just about in time. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. That's the best thing you can do against a pig that is crouching. You shouldn't really challenge a pig on a part like that unless you absolutely have to because you're probably not going to win a 50-50 with a pig on that tile. Keep in mind she's probably going to double back fake so you could try and get away with it but even then it's really not a good idea to try and challenge a pig on a part like that. It's always often better to try and abandon the tile and go to the next one. Now obviously in a jungle gym etc you've got a bit more to work with here so if she crouches and tries to dash you in a jungle gym or, or a TNL wall, etc., it's always best to try and just keep a line of sight on her or just try and keep tracking on her. It can be difficult without a red light and it can be difficult because she's so tiny, but it's always important to try and keep line of sight on her. Stick to the corners of the TNL wall, so rather than running down the entire wall, wait at like a corner so you can see down both sides so that you can try and see from two different angles where she is and only once you see her try and commit to a tile try and commit to a side if she's playing well it's often you will also get hit in this situation not always but sometimes so depending again on the situation if you've got an exit plan it's always best to try and abandon the tile to the next one and the last thing is when you're sitting on a gen if you know that the killer is a pig try you need to try and look behind you in a lot of tiles like if you're in a corner of the map um, and you don't normally traditionally look behind you because it's obviously there's no killer there looking behind you in these areas will still help you because the pig could sneak around the back and then go from the grab at the back as well and keep an eye out for the sheath sound keep an eye out for that noise because you know the pig is right next to you and it, you'll end up getting hit rather than getting grabbed which is the better scenario for you as a survivor and in order to prevent all of that, she also actually breathes very loud, so you can try and listen out for her breathing, although it does sound very, very similar to a Claudette's, so... So if you can't hear that in every situation, then you are excused. This is, like, where a lot of the fun of playing against a pig comes from, is when a pig is actively trying to hit you with her power all the time, you have to be so alert as a survivor to keep constantly tracking where she is in order to keep dodging all the hits. It's honestly so fun to play against, and you can do so many cool my games with her and against her. And this is the cool part of her that you just don't get to see that often, because a lot of people just don't use the power very often. 
And which, this is partly why her power works so well against survivors, is because a lot of pigs don't do it. If all the pigs probably did it, a lot of survivors would dodge a lot more hits, but because so many people don't don't use her power at all, a lot of survivors just have no clue what to do against it, and they panic, and they end up getting hit from it. As of 5.3.0, pigs received an add-on complete rework. So in this bit here, I'm going to take you through all of the new add-ons, what they do, and the best scenarios in which to use them, which will allow you to choose them more effectively and efficiently in your builds that you're going to pick. So I'm going to start with the two add-ons that I mainly use. Uh, these two didn't change, but I want to talk about all of the add-ons she's got. Starting off with the combat strap, uh, this is... The main add-on I use with Pig, it reduces the base time to crouch by 0.3 seconds, taking it from 1.3 seconds to crouch and stand up to 1 second. So it's a second to crouch and then another second to stand up. Uh, this is a really, really good add-on, even though it seems like it's only 0.3 of a second. Like, that's a huge amount of time. Basically, what it does is it allows you to react at pallet loops quicker and more efficiently during chase so you crouch you crouch immediately then you can dash straight away it also allows you to stand up quicker so if you crouch and they run from the loop for example like we spoke earlier in the guide uh, you can stand up immediately and then chase after them so you lose much much less distance and when you combine the 0.3 you gain by crouching and then the additional 0.3 by standing up you're over half a second closer to them than you would have been which half a second is a lot in DVD. It's a huge amount. It allows you just to be more responsive around pallet loops because, like I said earlier, they typically run in a direction of your choosing and now not only are they in your direction of your choosing, that you're also half a second better off than you were. Second add-on that is unchanged, which I will talk about, is the other one I use, going through all the browns first. Shattered Syringe. Now this add-on reduces the cooldown of a missed dash by 25%. I personally use this over the workshop grease. Um, however, you may not. I personally do this because it would affect muscle memory for me because I'm used to the base charge time. Um, so this add-on reduces, like I said, the cooldown by 25, meaning you lose less distance when missing a dash. A lot less distance, like a quarter is a huge amount to be taking off. And basically, this allows you to just take more risks with your ambush. It allows you to use it in scenarios where you're like, mm, this might not hit, but I'm going to try it anyway. And if it benefits me, cool. If it doesn't benefit me, I recover from this faster. So basically, I use this with Combat Strap to just speed everything up that I do. The way I play is I typically just use perks that make the interactions and the animations quicker like this. So stuff like this, really good for me. Love this sort of thing. Great. Moving on to another add-on, this one is the Interlocking Razor. Now, this add-on causes deep wound on a survivor that fails a skill check on a saw box if they're already injured. Now, this add-on is going to combo well with another add-on that we'll get to later. But for now, I'm going to wait on this description for properly until we've covered that add-on as well. Because there's a lot I want to say about both of them, but I'm going to wait until the second one shows up. Moving on to the medical file. Now, this is a really neat add-on. This increases the crouch movement speed, like when you're walking around, on uh, walking around crouch, by 6%. Which allows you basically to sneak up to gens easier. So, you know, you crouch, you can sneak around faster. This is great. It also means that you can crouch around sneaking during chase. So if you're a maze tile, a jungle gym, it's a big line of sight blocker. You can crouch. I pair this with combat strap as well. You can crouch. You then can sneak around 6% faster. So you can sort of close the gap between you and the survivor while crouched. And keep in mind, you've got no red light. You've got no heartbeat, no nothing when you're crouched. So they don't really know where you are unless they see you. So you can sneak around much quicker, get that line of sight blocked, get around to them, and then you can dash from this new spot to them. So it's actually really quite a nice add-on. It's it's brand new, and I actually really like it. I've been playing around with it a lot, having a lot of fun with it. It's not amazing, but it's a really fun add-on, really nice add-on, actually, for this combo. Great as well. Good set of browns, apart from interlocking, you could argue, obviously. 
but three of the four are solid brown rarity add-ons. Right, let's move on to the yellow ones, the uncommons. Okay, so this is the workshop grease. Now this add-on is the old videotape add-on. Uh, it increases the speed of her dash by 50%, the charge speed of her dash by 50%. So it charges up really, really, really quickly. And it also reduces the cooldown by 25%. So yes, this does stack with Shatter Syringe if you wanted to. You could get a really fast cooldown dash if that's what you're going for in your build. It works, it stacks. I p mostly pair this add-on with the last will and i will talk about the last will in detail in a second but it's a really really nice add-on it's actually really good as well if you if muscle memory is not really something you care about then it really does work nicely with the combat strap allowing you to crouch and then dash very 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 quickly i can't use it because muscle memory but if that's you know if that's something that doesn't affect you it's great um now we move on to the last will this is what i mainly pair workshop grease with last will increases the speed in which you actually dash by six percent and it incurs a 66 percent penalty in charge up speed now this is really good despite the massive penalty six percent movement speed like running like sp dash speed while you're running is a lot and especially when you get better with the dash, you can really catch up with people and hit them on pallet loops that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Shack becomes much, much easier to deal with with this add-on, for example. And then I stack it with the workshop grease because it reduces the 66% penalty to 16, which is negligible. And with the way that Pig works on these pallet loops, because you don't move anyway, you, they don't really... You don't really lose distance with this penalty, despite you might think, ooh, that's a big penalty. If you stack them both together, you don't really notice the penalty. It ends up working really, really well. I cannot recommend Last Will with this add-on enough. It's insanely fun. It's insanely strong. Plenty of examples of maps where you cannot dash without this add-on on a lot of pallets. I already mentioned the shack. There's a good few examples on the game map that you cannot dash without this add-on. There's a good few on the Pale Rose as well, the, in, and, and on Grim Pantry, the swamp, where you, you cannot dash without this combo. It's great. Very all for it. Fantastic. So, I'm going to clump a bunch of add-ons together here. We've got the Utility Blade, the Face Mask, the Slow Release Toxin, the Rusty Attachment, now, all of these add-ons are status effect add-ons. And what that means is, when this helmet is on your head, X status effect is applied. It's either hemorrhage, mangled, exhaustion, blindness. Now, all of these add-ons, except the blindness one, have the same problem, which is it only affects them while the helmet is active. There's no lingering effect afterwards. Which means that unless you're putting these helmets on specifically to tunnel them, then you're not really going to get much use out of these add-ons. Now, I suppose you could argue the mangled one will keep them injured, but add-ons like the exhausted one, for example, are simply only going to affect them if you're tunneling. And if you're tunneling a helmet as pig, you're not really playing pig properly because the people with helmets on aren't going to be doing generators they're going to be preoccupied with the saw boxes so honestly i would say to avoid all of these add-ons really the face mask is the only exception because you can get a really strong slugging build with this especially with third seal now that's not basic attack only you can do some really nasty slugging builds with the face mask but apart from the face mask honestly they're pretty useless especially utility blade which causes hemorrhage and hemorrhage is a pretty bad status effect. For those of you that don't know, hemorrhage causes more bleeding. That's basically it. So it allows you to locate trapped people quicker, which is something you don't really want as pig, honestly. So I'd honestly avoid all these, except maybe the face mask with your slugging build. And some of these are green rarity as well. It's just, yeah, I would avoid, would avoid these if I were you. They're still not brilliant. Next, we move on to the Razor Wire. Now, this add-on is the second combo add-on for 
the interlocking razor, which I spoke about earlier. Now, what the razor wire does is it injures a survivor if they fail a skill check on a saw box. And the workshop grease causes deep wound on a survivor that fails a skill check on a saw box if they are already injured. So basically, you can you combine these two add-ons and you hope that they fail two skill checks. Now, this would be really neat, and I do like the idea of a skill check build for Pig with saw boxes. I think it would work really quite nicely. The issue is there are no way of making there's no way of making the skill checks harder. So the skill checks are the same difficulty as they are on generators, which means unless the player is brand new, they're not really going to notice these two add-ons, which then in turn means that they are just useless really they'd be re it'd be really nice if you could bring a perk like none of the skill check perks affect saw boxes you know unnerving presence huntress lullaby etc none of these perks have any impact on saw boxes so unless the survivors you're against are really brand new you're not going to get any use out of either one of these two add-ons which is a massive shame because i'd really like a skill check build with pig with her boxes, but sadly it's not to be, unless you yourself are very new to DBD, which is likely if you're watching this guide, you know. If you are very new to DBD, I would suggest using them briefly, you have a feel for them, because, you know, your skill checks, the survivors you're playing against might miss some skill checks, but if you're quite experienced with DBD, but just want to move on to Pig for something new, I would avoid them, because you're not going to get any use out of them. Which is a shame, really, because they could have been pretty nice, but not to be. Next, we move on to the rule set number two. Now, this add-on hides the auras of saw boxes from survivors unless the helmet is active. Even the blindness add-on doesn't hide saw boxes traditionally. It's just this add-on. The only way to hide auras for the saw box auras for survivors is by using rule set number two. Uh, this add-on is great, actually. It's really good when combined with another add-on. If you do not combine this with videotape, the add-on is useless. However, when combined with videotape, it is very, very good. Because what videotape does is every survivor starts the trial with a helmet equipped. You have no helmets as the pig, but everyone has their helmet equipped. So everyone spawns in, everyone's got a helmet on, no one can see the box auras because of rule set two. So the survivors have to run around frantically looking for the saw boxes without knowing where they are. Like the helmets aren't active, but if they do a gen, then everyone's helmet's active and there's a mad rush. So it's actually really, really good, specifically with vi when paired with videotape. Without that, would recommend you avoid it. But, you know, if you've got a videotape, this is a great combo to have with that add-on. Moving on to Jigsaw's annotated plan. So, the main reason you use this add-on is because it gives you a plus one helmet. Same thing with the Jigsaw sketch. Uh, however, the annotated plan knocks 10 seconds off of the helmet timer for every generator that is turned on. But it also increases the death timer by 10 seconds at default. So the timer is 2 minutes and 40 seconds with this add-on, not 2 minutes and 30. So, yeah, it's, it's more of a niche kind of meme build. You won't really, in open play, get any use out of this. It does work in every scenario, so on a hook, it will tick down by 10. Even if a gen pops on, it will do it in a chase as well. There is no hiding from the gen. You can't block it as a survivor. It will tick down. Um, you know, it will knock the 10 seconds off. I mean, there's no way of hiding from it, but it, it's still not massively useful. The add-on's great, though, and I highly recommend you using it purely because it gives you plus one helmet. And plus one helmet is a lot of extra slowdown. So just for the sake of the plus one alone, it's it's good. It is good add-on. It's a good add-on. Next, we move on to the crate of gears and the bag of gears. Now, these two add-ons are effectively your slowdown add-ons. They increase the time it takes to search a saw box. That's all they do. And when stacked, it's really slow. It's, it's really slow, actually, like unbelievably slow. So effectively, the survivors end up wasting more time. That's 
the gist of it. It's quite a good add-on combo, stacking double gears. It, they're very slow. You've got plenty more time as killer to do whatever you want, you know, chasing. So the helmets stay on for much longer. They, you probably won't get head pops with it, but very much a slowdown add-on. And uh, killers these days love slowing the game down. So I think these will be very used. Next, we move on to Tampa Timer. Sadly, Tampa Timer is in the game still. It is by far her strongest add-on. Uh, it allows for head pops in almost every game when stacked with a gear. It, it's just, it's really strong. If it was down to me, Tampa Timer would get reworked into something a lot more useful for the killer. Uh, just more fair in general. I won't discuss it in this video since this is a guide. But uh, this is still her strongest add-on. If you're going to use it, use it properly with gears but if i were you i would avoid it you'll be a better player that way you'll just you'll be a better player you'll end up being a better player you will learn how to kill survivors yourself rather than bringing an add-on and letting the add-on do it for you so yeah you'll be a better player but if you want to use it for whatever reason it's a very 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 strong add-on and i'd use it with a crate of gears Moving on to the Jigsaw Sketch. Now, this add-on also gives you an extra helmet. And yes, if you stack it with the annotated plan, you will get six helmets, which is unbelievably good. Like, really good. It's a lot of slowdown. It also has a secondary effect, which shows you the aura of any generator that is being worked on if the survivor working on the generator has a helmet on their head which is, means it's also another very good add-on to stack with videotape because everyone spawns in. If they start doing gens, you see where they spawned. So it works nicely with the videotape as well. So videotape has two different combos. You can run it with Jigsaw Sketch or the rule set, both of which are great. I'd say rule set is a bit stronger, but Jigsaw Sketch gives you a plus one helmet, which means if you run videotape with it, you will spawn with one helmet rather than zero, so it, it does give you that extra bit of slowdown. Moving on to Amanda's Secret, this add-on is effectively another one of those tunnel add-ons. Disables the pig's ability to see jigsaw boxes, so you can't see them as pig, period. But you gain a notification when a survivor removes the bear trap from their head, and you also see their aura for six seconds. So basically, you stack this with the mangled add-on, so they typically won't heal through mangled, which means that when the helmet comes off, you see their aura and you you know they're injured because of the mangled, so you head straight to them and tunnel them down and get them out of the game. That's the gist of the add-on combo. Yes, it's very unfun for everybody involved, but it's in the game, so I've got to talk about it, and that's what it does. Moving on to the videotape, we've spoken about this a lot already, and like I said, survivors begin the trial with a reverse bear trap already installed. This is taken out of your inventory, so if you run the videotape, you will spawn with no helmets, but they will have, you know, all four already on them. Run this with the rule set number two. It is very, very good with rule set, or with the jigsaw sketch. Like I said earlier, both of these combos are very good. The add-on as well is very good. It's a nice add-on. It's a neat idea for an add-on. I'm all for it. It is great. And finally, we have Amanda's Letter. This is more of a training add-on. It's a fun kind of Mirror Myers-y add-on. You bring this on Larry's, for example, and you can scare the hell out of people. You, uh, when crouched, you see the auras of survivors within 16 meters. It reduces the number of bear traps you have by three. So you have one helmet and four boxes. You get a little bit of slowdown, but the point of this add-on is to run up with a combat strap so you can stand up and crouch quicker to get that up-to-date information. And you basically crouch around scaring people. It's good. I like it a lot. It's obviously not brilliantly strong because you lose your slowdown, but it's a lot of fun. It's also doubles up as a training add-on. You can bring this add-on on any map, really. Corn maps, anything with a jungle gym. And basically, you can crouch with this add-on. And then you can watch what the survivor does. See how they run. See what paths they take when, they, when you're crouched. Like, how do they react? Get used to it with this add-on. And then when you take the add-on off and you crouch, 
that survivor is going to keep doing the same thing. It doesn't matter that you now can't see the survivor. You know roughly what path they're going to take because you've had enough practice with Amanda's letter seeing how a typical survivor reacts when you crouch. So you can use this add-on to end up making your dashes a lot more of a educated dash rather than just a pure guess. So I like this for training as well as scaring people. You won't get kills with it, obviously, because you've got three less helmets, but it is a really nice add-on for training yourself up to being able to dash at someone properly at a maze tile. So for that reason alone with a combat strap, I cannot recommend it enough. I think it's great. Now we move on to perks. I want to talk initially about my main build that I use on Pig. Because this is the one that I use on stream all of the time. This is the primary build that I think you should run on Pig. Obviously other builds are available. I will talk about a variety of different things, of course. But I want to spend the majority... Because there's so many perks in this game now. There's six pages of perks. There's a new killer coming out very soon. Time of recording. The perk lineup is ever-changing. And honestly, if we sat and discussed every perk individually, we would be here all day. So I want to categorize perks in a chart I will show you later. But for now, I want to discuss my personal build that I use with Pig. I will then show you a chart of all the perks in the game of where I categorize them, etc. And then it will allow you at that point to make your own minds up about what sort of build you want to use on Pig. Now, the build I use is Brutal Strength, Martyr and Abuse, Whispers, and Enduring. Now, I need to explain why you want to use this build. So, Pig is an, a mouse one killer. She is an M1 killer. You will primarily be holding down W, chasing survivors. You will get to a pallet loop, you will crouch, you will dash. You might hit them, you might not. As a result of being an M1 killer, you are going to be tanking a lot of pallets in order to play efficiently. That's just the way M1 killers work. You want to get the map cleaned out as quickly as you can because there's just a lot of safe pallets that need cleaning. So for that reason, I use Enduring. I want to get that 50% stun, so I want to tank as many pallets as possible because the big mistake all killer players that are new do is they respect pallets. They are terrified of being pallet stunned because they think it isn't the right way to play, etc. You want to get pallet stunned as killer. You want to get that pallet gone. You don't want to fear pallets, so just hold down the key, walk through the pallet, take control of the pallet as pig and crouch. I want to do that as often as I can. Therefore, I run this, and I also run Brutal, but we'll get to that later. But I mainly primarily run this just to get the pallets gone and recover quickly and get back in the game as fast and efficiently as I can. That is why. Next, we have Whispers and Monitor and Abuse. I want to pair these two up together because they're both related. Now, Whispers, in my humble opinion, is the best tracking perk in the game. And for me, I would much rather track and get into chases much more efficiently than slow the game down with slowdown perks. That's just my personal way of playing. I don't like slowdown perks. You will know this. I like efficiency. I like getting people down as quickly as I can through chase perks and then using detection perks to get back into chase as quickly as I can. That's just my playstyle. I use whispers because it is the best chase tracking perk in the game. Effectively, when a survivor is within 32 meters of your location, the perk turns on. It allows you to then triangulate their location. Just the more you use this perk, you will understand how it works. There's plenty of guides out there on how to use whispers. I actually might make a whispers guide at some point. But for now, there's enough guides on YouTube on how to use whispers. So I won't really talk in too much detail about that. But I use that for this. And I also pair it with monitor and abuse. Because there's two reasons why I use whispers. First reason is detection. Second reason is stealth. I use Martin Abuse on Pig, and you might think, why? That's a really weird perk. She's a stealth killer. You want to have... Why do you need a smaller heartbeat? Now, Pig's heartbeat is 32 meters. Whispers is also 32 meters. 
pig's heartbeat doesn't disappear the moment you crouch. It fades, and it doesn't start fading until the entire crouch animation is done. So you go through the entire one second with a combat strap or 1.3 second animation without a combat strap, and only then does the heartbeat start to fade. And then it takes four seconds to fade. Doesn't matter how big or small the heartbeat is, it will always take four seconds. So I run monitor and abuse at the same time. Because with this, my heartbeat is 24 meters. Whispers turns on at 32. You don't hear my heartbeat at this point, but I know you're there. So I then crouch. And because of MA, my heartbeat starts to shrink from 24 meters instead of 32. And it takes four seconds still, even though it's 24. So because of this perk, I don't, they don't hear my heartbeat at all because I want to crouch with whispers. And the reason why I crouch when whispers is on is because there's a survivor nearby. Pig is slow when crouched. She's 4.6 meters a second when not crouched, 3.6 meters a second when crouched. Pig is very slow when crouched. You don't want to do it very often when not in chase. You want to be as efficient as you can with your crouching. This allows efficiency because even if you don't understand how to use whispers, I'd still recommend using it on pig just for the simple fact of whispers is on, someone must be nearby, I'm going to crouch. And that way, you know they don't know you're there. Obviously, spine chills in the game, but whatever. They know you're not, you know, you know that, that they don't know you're there. And then you run it with this, and it allows efficiency. It allows the people of the generator to not hear your com the, the, your coming. You can sneak up to the generator, and you can pull them off of the gen. That is why I use m a with Whispers. I think it's a very, very good perk combo. Now, we move on to Brutal Strength. Brutal Strength is a throwaway perk. This is the build. This perk slot is empty. You can put whatever perk you want in this slot, whether it's barbecue or bamboozle or nurse's calling, or I would recommend, highly recommend I'm all ears in that slot. I think it's an outstandingly good perk. Yes, you can put slowdown perks in this slot. If you want to use pop goes the brain cell, you can put it in this slot, etc. cetera. Uh, I use brutal strength mainly because I'm addicted to it, but it's also for me, it's part of my belief of how to play this game. I like efficiency in pallets. I like getting pallets cleaned out quicker. This lets me get walls and pallets and gens cleaned out and kicked quicker. For me, it's more efficiency. I think it's a very good perk on pig. However, if you do not want to use brutal strength or you want to edit this build into your own unique thing, that's the perk you swap out and you can put whatever the hell you want in that slot. I don't recommend Spirit Fury because Spirit Fury promotes early dropping of pallets. If a survivor figures out you've got Spirit Fury, they do not let you get to that pallet. They drop the pallet straight away. And if they're dropping pallets, your Nox are going to get a chance to dash because the pallet's already dropped. So I don't recommend Spirit Fury, but other than Spirit Fury, you're free to choose what you want in this slot. This, in my opinion, is the strongest pig build in the game, unless you're going to go uber sweaty and you want a 4k streak because... I don't know why you want to do that. But if you do want to do that, there's obviously a more sweaty build that you could use. But in terms of just having a good time and playing Pig to improve your gameplay at her, I think this is the best build you can run. These three perks. I'm all ears, I want to talk about as well. And because it effectively acts as a budget Amanda's letter. So you can run a full build with full add ons, and then you can have I'm all ears on top of that and you can be doubly efficient with your crouching at jungle gyms because you can see them. Obviously, from that point on, I'm going to just put up a category of perks as to what they fall into, and then you will genuinely get your own build up. As a new player, you obviously won't have these perks because three of them are teachable. Surveillance is a great perk on Pig. That's one of the perks she has. Whispers is a non-teachable perk, so you'll have that by default. Yes. You can run Whispers without monitor and abuse. It is just a bit more of a faff. When Whispers turns on and you don't have MA, 
stand in place, and then back up a few steps until Whispers turns off, then crouch, then walk forwards again. It's a bit of a faff, but it has to be done if you want the people of the gen to not know you're coming. So it is doable, it just this saves you a bit more time. So, you know, you'll you'll pick the perks you want from how you feel like you play her. I'm just showing you the build I recommend. Now, another build that you can use on Pig is Hex Ruin. With Undying, but Ruin. We'll focus on Ruin and Surveillance. Now, a lot of people typically will 99 gel, uh, gens versus Pig just because they don't really want the you know them to activate because of the helmet. And what Ruin does is it basically stops them doing that. They can no longer 99 generators because if they let go, it starts regressing down to zero. What Ruin does is exactly that. When a survivor lets go of the gen, it will immediately start regressing at double the normal speed. So basically, it prevents and removes 99 gens. And then if they do decide to do it, you see the gen with surveillance. And then, you know, Undying keeps this up longer. So you can use these two together, Ruin and Surveillance, to basically keep the gens going. And it makes the helmets active constantly because they cannot 99 gens to block helmets. They have to keep going. Cannot stop doing it. Another neat combo. I also want to talk a little bit about Say the Best for Last, since this is a perk I get a lot of questions about. Long story short, no, I do not recommend this perk on Pig. Now let me explain why. AWS for last reduces the weapon wipe speed on any M1 hit. Now, here's the thing. Most of the time, you really should be dashing, and especially with the way this guide suggests that you play, you really should be dashing most of the time. So assuming you've got my normal build on, the Brutal Enduring Whispers Martyr Abuse build, a third of your hits, realistically, are going to be dashes. Another third of your hits, realistically, are going to be Enduring tanked anyway. So you swing, you get hit, you're tanked with Enduring, Enduring cancels the weapon wipe anyway. Meaning only roughly a third of your then hits are going to be set of us for last. Is that really worth it to you? Because to me, it's not worth it. The only example of where the perk is useful is if you go and gen grab someone and you mess up the gen grab in some way, whether that be dedicated servers or the survivor saw you coming. The only scenario in which you will get use out of that perk is messing up a gen grab. That's the only time it will help you. Is it really worth bringing a full perk just for that? If you ask me, it's not. So I really don't think you should use that perk on Pig. There are definitely other perks that you really could and probably should be running instead. So that's my little take on save. I don't think you should use it again. If you want to use it, fine. I can't stop you, but if you ask me, you shouldn't be using it. And here you can see all of the other perks available. Uh, I've put them into categories of effectively what they do. You've got the chase perks, the slowdown perks, the detection perks, some situational ones, and then some perks that I honestly wouldn't recommend you use on Pig. Uh, I think this is the easiest way of doing it. Uh, it lets you sort of pick your own build of what you want from her. And then from here, honestly, just pick what you want. I either do my build and then have the fourth slot as whatever you want with one of these perks. Or what you could do instead is just very simply... Pick four perks from this list, up to you. Different ways of doing it, I think this is the best way. If you want more information on some perks, then check out my perk, pig perk guide that's specifically for this. It doesn't include every perk, it's just all the uh, DLC perks that my original pig guide missed, but it will go into a lot more detail than here since there are just simply too many perks to include in this video. 
and that should just about do it. That should be everything you need to know about Pig. Like I said before, if you need more info, check out the perk guide. I will link that at the end of the video. And for the most part, this includes everything. Again, I will be updating this guide if they ever change Pig's base kit, which doesn't look like it's ever going to happen. But for now, this is the most up-to-date guide available for Pig in general. Hope it helps. Everything's timestamped. Everything is linked. Thank you everyone that helped put this together, part of the original guide, and then my editor my uh for making all of the charts and the thumbnail etc and i will catch you in the next one everybody later